Hello, everyone. We're just going to give another minute for people to come on in. All right, to be respectful of time, I'm gonna go ahead and start and people can come in as we're doing the introduction. So welcome today um, to our, our lecture, our Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics lecture. My name is Robin Axel Adams. I am the manager here at the Fairbanks Center. And we're so glad you're joining us remotely today. We are really excited to announce that we do plan on having our April 6th lecture in person. Uh, we will always offer our lectures virtually. So please register the same way that you have. Um, and we will announce soon where the location, whether it's gonna be at Methodist or at, at The Rock. So we look forward to seeing you then. Um, today's lecture, we are so excited to share that it is being co-sponsored by our colleagues at the IU Health Risk Retention Group. The IUHRRG was formed in 2004 to meet the professional and general liability insurance needs of Indiana University Health, its affiliates, and employed healthcare providers. And so we're so glad today to collaborate with Jen and with Liz, and um, they will come on at the end if we have any risk questions that they will be able to, to answer with us. And so we're glad to have some of um, their audience with us today. A few preliminaries. Um, we may have some hiccups with Zoom, and if that happens, we just thank you ahead of time for being patient with us. This webinar is being recorded. Um, it will be available sometime in the next couple of weeks at our website, fairbankscenter.org. Um, Annie is on vacation this week, and so it might take her a little bit longer to get it up, but it'll be up soon. Um, the recordings is el are eligible for CE for 30 days and for CME for up to a year. And so um, please feel free to pass along this information to your colleagues. You will receive a link in the eval for your CME or CE tomorrow if you're watching it today um, at, the e at the email address that you used when you registered for this webinar. And we encourage you to fill out that, that uh, evaluation even if you don't need credit because it does help us to track our virtual attendance and allows you to provide feedback and comments to us. Please know that the Q&A box is available um, to post questions. However, that we will not be responding to most questions until the end of the presentation when Dr. Locke is ready. Um, and Dr. Locke, I should also share, has no financial conflicts of interest to disclose. All right, so with all of that out of the way, I'm so excited to share um, and to introduce to you Dr. Locke, who is an assistant professor of clinical obstetrics and gynecology from, um, from, from Indiana University. She earned her BA from Taylor University in 2009 and her MD from Indiana University in 2014. She sees patients at the Coleman Center at University Health and at the Eskenazi Transgender Health and Wellness Center. She is passionate about taking care of LGBTQ plus patients, as well as educating the next generations of physicians about LGBTQ plus health issues. She serves as the um, ACOG District 5 Junior Fellow Legislative Chair and is on the IUSM LGBTQ Healthcare Committee. And she lives in Indianapolis with her wife and children and Kat, who I think we might see in the background once in a while. So Dr. Locke, we're so excited to have you with us. Thank you. And I will turn this over to you. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really excited to be here today. Um, I take care of a lot of people who work at IU, so I know I have some patients in the audience, which makes me really excited. So wanting to talk today about LGBTQ competent care and how we can do this better. I um, just want to preface that like, you know, when they asked me to do this talk, I was kind of feeling upbeat and excited about this. This has been a really rough, uh, like month for queer people in the United States. And so like kind of has a different tone for me right now. You know, we're really seeing a lot of attacks on LGBTQ, but especially trans rights right now. And so this feels more, even more urgent to me that we have this talk and that, um, you know, you all understand these issues as people in healthcare. So, um, yeah, like if I seem a little bit angry at times during the talk, it's because I am like things are really bad right now for my patients and also for people that I love. So just um, I also want to just say, like, please feel free to ask questions and moderators, like if there are questions that it's like, oh, clearly people are not understanding what I'm talking about. Please feel free to like cut me off, ask questions as I go. Um, I have no financial disclosures, um, no conflicts of interest, but I am a queer person. Um, I am married to my spouse, Kim. They're a non-binary person. We have two kids. My 10 year old daughter loves to tell people that she is bisexual. She's very excited about that identity right now. Um, most of my friends are queer. Like I exist in this space very much like that this is my world. And so sometimes I forget what cisgender heterosexual people know about 
my world. So if something I'm saying, you're like, what is that? Please hop in, please ask. Um, I'm happy to break things down even more. So no conflicts of interest other than I'm incredibly gay. <laughs> There's my gay family at Pride. I think the last time Pride was in person, which was a really long time ago. So we're gonna start with a lot of definitions. So breaking things down. Um, so sex, like sex is referring to someone's gender assigned at birth. And like, as a person who delivers babies who like literally assigns people's gender at birth, we don't really put a whole lot of thought into this. It's really based on what someone's external genitalia looks like. So sex is that gender assigned at birth based on, you know, what your genitals look like. And, um, you know, usually that's it. We usually don't get any more involved than that. Gender identity is one internal sex female, both, or neither, or somewhere in the middle. And transgender means a person whose gender identity is different than their sex assigned at birth. And cisgender is a person whose gender identity corresponds to their gender assigned at birth. So for example, I am a cisgender woman. So I was assigned female at birth and I identify as female. So I'm a cisgender woman. Um, a trans man, that would be someone who's assigned female at birth, but identifies as male, their gender identity is male. A trans woman is someone who was assigned male at birth, but identifies as female. A non-binary person is someone who identifies outside of the gender binary. They don't identify as male or female. Uh, gender queer, someone who doesn't identify strictly with male or female. You know, this is just kind of another nuance of non-binary. Gender fluid is someone whose gender identity and or experience Expression changes. Um, sometimes they express themselves more masculine, sometimes more feminine. Um, and really like breaking that down because sometimes it, it's important to know, like if I say my patient is a trans man, it's important to know, like when I say that, like, okay, these are the body parts they were born with and this is what their gender identity is. Like it's important to be able to know that just from saying that one phrase. So gender dysphoria, you're going to hear us use this word a lot. This isn't like my favorite phrase, but it's what we have to work with. Um, there's a lot of conversation among the trans community uh, that this isn't that this isn't the best way to talk about this, but it's what we have. So, um, gender dysphoria is referring to that discomfort or distress that is caused by the discrepancy between a person's gender identity and that person's sex assigned at birth and the associated associated gender role and primary and secondary sex characteristics. So the reason why you know some trans people don't love this is because it's framing their entire identity as a negative when I mean is it? <laughs> um, so, you know, it's not perfect, but that is the medical definition that we use. And that's like the diagnosis code that I use when I do gender affirmation surgery. So gender affirmation surgery, this is replacing the term sex reassignment surgery. Please never say that or sex change surgery. We don't say that anymore. That's really offensive. Don't say that. Um, so gender affirmation surgery, because this is affirming the gender that the person has always been. They were assigned female at birth, but it's not, they used to be a boy, right? They were always who they were. Their body just didn't line up with it. And maybe they didn't have the words to express it, um, or the support to express who they really were, but they've always been who they were. Just like I didn't used to be straight, <laughs> even though I used to be married to a man, I just didn't have the social support or the, um, you know, resources to understand my sexual identity, right? I've always been queer, used to be married to a man, never was straight. Okay. So, um, replaces that term. So it's gender affirmation surgery and that surgery performed to help someone's body align with their gender. So there's a huge range of gender affirmation surgery. It can be everything from top surgery. So that surgery to uh, remove the breast and give the chest a more masculine appearance for trans men or uh, non-binary people. My spouse personally had that surgery this year and that was a really incredible life-changing surgery for them. Um, it can refer to bottom surgery. So for trans feminine people, surgery that gives their genital, like creating a vagina out of either penile tissue or other tissue that's too medical for this talk. <laughs> um, or it can even refer to, um, creating a penis out of different, um, 
tissues uh, for people who were assigned female at birth. So lots of, and then also sometimes refers to removing the uterus to make someone's uh, body more aligned with their gender. So any of those things can be gender affirmation surgery. And we do all of those things at IU. IU has a gender affirmation surgery team and with a robust uh, support team for that. And it's something that is fully accepted by IU. We have the full support of the you know, different departments that we work in and of IU leadership. Like this is something that we do and uh, we do it really well here at IU. So you might be thinking like, why are we even talking about this, right? Like you probably know some gay people, um, but you probably don't know trans people or you probably think you don't know trans people <laughs> is uh, probably more likely the case. Um, also just to pause and say, I'm saying queer. Sometimes that makes straight people uncomfortable. I've given these lectures and they're like, whoa, 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 I thought we didn't say queer. So um, a lot of people are using that phrase to describe themselves. That's how I personally describe my sexual identity. You know, I, my spouse is non-binary. So lesbian doesn't really feel like a comfortable term for me. Um, I would just say that like, you know, probably not something that you as straight people, assuming most of my audience is straight, assuming that you as straight people like don't use that term unless someone uses it first, but it is uh, for a lot of people, that's a term that we feel really comfortable with and that we've uh, reclaimed that used to be sort of a slur. Um, just referring to basically any sexual orientation that's not straight. <laughs> so, uh, so you may be thinking like, is this an issue? So the most recent data we have is from 2014 and it showed that there were 1.4 million transgender people in the United States. So like one and a half times the population of Indianapolis. That's well, not that many for the whole United States, but that's in 2014. That was double the number of the 2011 survey. So in three years, the number doubled. So if we did the survey now, eight years from then, we know the number would be much, much bigger. We don't have the numbers. They didn't include gender identity in the census that was done under President Trump, no surprise. Um, but we know that there are way more trans people than there used to be. And so this is a huge issue. There is, it's a really growing population and we need to be able to take care of these people. So you may be thinking, well, why are there so many trans people? I read some book by this lady and she says, this is just kids influencing each other. This is just like a trendy thing from TikTok and none of this is real, okay? Um, so I think a really helpful way of looking at this is the analogy of left-handedness. I love this as a left-handed person also. I really threw the genetic short stick as a queer person who's also left-handed. But um, so <laughs> the this is a graph showing the rates of left-handedness, okay? In, I think this is for the world, I can't remember. So uh, used to be like around 3% of the population. And then by 1976, it was 12% of the population. Was this because like people in the 70s just thought it was cool and trendy to be left-handed and people were like, hey, you know, it's cool to write with your left hand. You should try doing that. And we're just like influencing each other and people are just doing this to be different. No, what happened was that people stopped being forced to write with their right hand, right? So then people stopped being forced to be right-handed and they could express their left-handedness. They felt safe being left-handed. So then that number of left-handed people in the world really spiked. And then it settled out to what the actual expression of left-handedness is genetically in the population, which turns out to be between like, I don't know, it's like around 10-ish percent of the population. So that's where we're at right now with trans people. We are in the spike, right? Because you know, even just 10 years ago, this was not as socially accepted. There were no resources. There weren't clinics. You cannot in Indiana. I mean, there were a few people like pioneers, like Peggy Shepard here at IU who were doing gender affirming hormones, but there was not access to this care. Like there is now for people like my spouse, who, you know, has always been a masculine of center lesbian, there were not the words for what they were feeling of like, I don't really fit with men or women. There weren't words like non-binary. There just, there wasn't access to this information. People didn't 
have the information. And so now there's access to care, there's access to information. And so, yeah, like there is an explosion in trans people, but it's not because it's cool or trendy. It's because people are getting the words and the vocabulary for what they've always felt inside. They're also getting access to the care. They're feeling safer briefly, it's getting less safe again to come out as trans. And so that's why you're seeing so many more trans people. This has nothing to do with trendiness. This has nothing to do with like the internet and Instagram influencing kids or whatever nonsense you're going to hear from some like really misguided transphobic resources okay there's a really big anti-trans backlash happening right now and it is not science-based and uh be very wary of that information so like is this just liberal nonsense like do you need to like ignore what i'm saying because this is like a political issue this does not belong in medicine like no it doesn't this is actually evidence-based medicine. Every major medical organization supports gender dysphoria as a medical diagnosis and supports treating gender dysphoria as the standard of care. Literally every single one. There is not a major medical organization that says this is a controversial issue. We have great data that shows that treating gender dysphoria literally saves lives. So trans people who don't get gender affirming care are much more likely to commit suicide. And it's not because there's something wrong with trans people's brains. It's because it's really hard to exist in the world with a body that doesn't align with your gender on top of all the ways that you're already being discriminated against and rejected by your family. So the one thing we can do is at least make their body align with their gender and that saves lives, okay? So all of the major medical organizations support it. All of the major, major medical organizations oppose conversion therapy, both for queer people and for trans people. This is evidence-based medicine, okay? And just quite frankly, if you aren't willing to get comfortable with LGBTQ people, you shouldn't work at IU Health. Just being really honest, like this is a patient population that we take care of and that we're gonna take great care of. And part of taking great care of them is being willing to take care of them and not being willing, not taking care of them thinking like, well, I actually think this is bullshit. Like you gotta get on board. Like this is science, this is real. This is like, this is where medicine is headed. If this makes you uncomfortable, there are lots of other places where you could work. So just, just being real honest here. So, also, like, why does this matter? Because healthcare needs to be a safe place for this patient population. This is a patient population that faces incredible discrimination and violence. So as far as homelessness, more than 50% of all homeless youth are LGBTQ, okay? Whereas like 10% of all youth are LGBTQ, 50% of our, all homeless youth are LGBTQ. People are still getting kicked out of their homes when they come out. Kids are still getting made to choose between living as their true gender or not having a place to live, okay? 20% of all trans women are homeless, 20%, which is just wild. There are lots of stats, like lots of studies showing this, 47 to 70% of all trans people have been sexually abused or assaulted. And I will tell you in my clinical experience, I think it's closer to that 70% number. I would say that most of my patients have been sexually abused or assaulted. And again, to be extremely clear, being sexually abused or assaulted, it does not make you trans. It does not make you gay, okay? It is that this is a patient population that is vulnerable, and predators sense vulnerability, okay? These are people who are rejected by their families, and those are the types of people that predators go against. So just to be clear, do not get it twisted. It is not that the abuse makes you gay or trans, it is that being gay or trans makes you vulnerable to abuse, okay? 40% um, of all trans women of color are HIV positive. Like this is just unacceptable, like unacceptable health outcomes in this population. And that's because, you know, this data, these trans women, they're homeless. So they end up having to participate in survival sex to survive, which leads to them becoming HIV positive. So it's just a patient population that faces more obstacles than you could ever imagine. One in four trans people surveyed reported avoiding a doctor's visit when they needed one in the last year just because they were afraid of how they would be treated. Um, trans people frequently report facing mistreatment in the healthcare system. And the thing is, is that it doesn't matter if that mistreatment is intentional or not, that still leads to people avoiding healthcare. And when people avoid healthcare, it leads to many of the negative health outcomes that we see in the LGBTQ population, which is things like, you know, for me as a gynecologist, things that keep me up at night, higher rates of cervical cancer. We shouldn't see higher rates of cervical cancer in the LGBTQ population. We don't have other independent risk factors for it, but it's that we avoid the doctor's office. 
Um, so things like that are really like they're killing queer people. And the way that we fix that is by making the healthcare system a safe and welcoming place for them. So the other thing is that like, we're literally under attack, like in all other spaces. Um, right now, there are dozens of anti-trans bills across the country. Uh, Texas just passed um, an executive order making gender affirming care, which again, all of the major medical organizations agree is standard of care. They're calling it child abuse when they're taking kids away from their parents if they uh, provide their kids with gender affirming care, which is just like unimaginable. And um, can't imagine uh, as a parent being faced with the choice of like giving my kid the care that they actually need to survive and thrive or being separated from them or having to leave my home. I mean, I just, it's unbelievable the things that are happening right now. Um, in Indiana, literally just this week, passed a bill banning trans girls from being able to play sports. All trans girls in grades K through 12 cannot play sports in public schools now in the state of Indiana. Um, can you imagine having a kid and having to look her in the eye and telling her that she's not allowed to play sports just because of her gender identity? Um, it's like, it's pretty horrifying the things that are happening right now. So that's the environment that our LGBTQ brothers and sisters are existing in right now. So how can we do better? Like, that's the background. That's like the world for queer people. Like, what can we do as a healthcare system? So just like some some things, some like tangible things. So how can we make patients feel welcome? So when a patient comes in, ask them, what name do you use and what are your pronouns? I know it sounds silly. I know it sounds simple. It makes a huge difference. Um, it's really affirming. It's really helpful. It's really, um, it makes a huge difference. Uh, having a pronoun badge on your ID badge makes a big difference. It shows patients like, hey, this is something that's on my radar. I know about trans issues. I am cognizant that maybe your pronouns aren't what I'm going to assume they are just by looking at you and you could tell me what they are and I'm going to respect them. And it really goes a long way towards making a patient feel safe. The other thing is like showing some grace if a patient's upset. I included this because, so just background for me, I like, I'm a OBGYN, but most of my patients are queer and a lot of my patients are trans. And I've had times where a patient goes to check in and Cerner is a really challenging system to use with getting patients correct name and pronouns to display. And the patient gets misgendered or dead named, which means like using their name that they don't use anymore. And the patient like goes off on whoever, like they go off on my front desk person or they like go off on my office manager or whatever. And um, I'm not saying that's okay. Like nobody should be rude to people, but like keep in mind that like, even though you're like, oh my God, it's not a big deal. It's just a name. Like, you don't know that like maybe before they got here today, like maybe they were on the phone with like their mom and like their mom still won't use their name. You know, like that's the case for a lot of my patients. That's the case for a lot of my friends. Like most people, like people that they love in their life, like won't use their right pronouns, won't use their right name. You know, it's like, just thing after thing after thing, you know, it's like constant. And so you may be like the 10th person to misgender them that day. And so they blow up on you and it's not personal. It's just like all the burdens of like all the things of going through the world as a trans person. And so just like showing some grace. Um, the other thing is like bearing in mind how hard it is for like our patients in this population to even like get to the hospital and get this care. Um, like with all of the homelessness and um, economic adversity that this patient population faces. Um, I've literally had patients. So um, a lot of times my patients will want um, hysterectomy and top surgery at the same time. Like they'll want those surgeries on the same day. So they'll have a consultation with me and a consultation with plastics leading up to those surgeries. And I have had patients who usually me and Dr. Haddad, the plastic surgeon, we don't do our consultations on the same day. Like we just don't have clinic on the same day. And I once had patients come for a consultation and um, they were like at the end of my day and they came in and they were like really apologetic about like, I'm sorry for my appearance or like my smell. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't care, whatever, like whatever. 
And then they disclosed to me that they had had their consultation with Dr. Haddad the day before. They lived several hours away from the hospital. They couldn't afford gas to drive back and forth from home to Indianapolis two days in a row. They couldn't afford a hotel to stay um, in Indy. They thought they would just hang out in the hospital lobby. They just thought that would be like an option overnight. Hospital lobbies close overnight. And so they had to sleep on the street overnight um, between their consultations and then like hung out on the street all day until their 3 p.m. gynecologist visit. So like, even though these patients were actually delightful and sweet and kind to everybody as they checked in, like, I don't know if you misgendered them after they've been like sleeping on the street all night for their consultations, because this is the only place in the whole damn state where you can get this care. I don't know, like maybe show them some grace. So just, I don't know, just, just that perspective. Like you just said, like, it's hard to realize what is going on for these patients to lead to them getting there to these visits. So, um, yeah. Uh, okay. So other things asking, who do you have with you today? Uh, instead of assuming about who's with them. And then is it okay if we talk about all of your health history in front of them today is just a really useful habit to get into. Um, there is nothing that pisses a gay off, like having you assume that your partner is your sister. Um, this even just happened to me recently. I was in the ED with like an intractable migraine, like barfing uncontrollably. And the ED resident like recognized me as like the queer gynecologist was like, oh my God, Dr. Locke, how are you? And I'm like, vomit, vomit, vomit. And he turned to my wife and said, is this your sister? And I just ah, please don't do that. It's so offensive. It's so annoying. Um, so it just getting in the habit of just who do you have with you today? It's real easy. You'll save yourself offending some straight people too. You know, <laughs> like you just, who do you have with you today? It's really easy. And then, you know, asking is it okay if we talk about all of your health history, like, I don't know, you don't know, like some trans people are not out as trans to everybody in their life. You don't know, just keep it safe. Um, again, that's like a best practice for everybody. Like, you don't know, like, God, the number of my patients who like, are like, don't you dare tell my mom that I have herpes, you know, <laughs> like that kind of thing. Like, it's just good habits, good habits to be in. So just really being conscious of not assuming that everybody is cisgender, heterosexual, and monogamous is critically important. Um, and like getting comfortable with that idea, like getting comfortable with the fact that like your patients may not be cis, het, monogamous, and that's okay. And those are valid ways of living your life. Those are, those are important habits to get into. Um, yeah. Uh, so like just some like other examples, uh, this picture is my, my spouse, um, nursing our baby pre-top surgery. I carried our baby and then they breastfed our baby. Also we co-nursed, you can do induced lactation and the non-gestational parent can nurse the baby. So I love that picture. Um, so it's relevant to this because, uh, making patients feel welcome can also mean not asking questions that are irrelevant. So, uh, an example of this, my spouse, non-binary went to their PAT appointment. So, uh, Kim's non-binary still going by Kim, just like, doesn't want to change their name, whatever. That's their business. When they went to their PAT appointment, the nurse was like, so are you changing your gender from male to female or female to male? <laughs> like none of your business PAT appointment lady, first of all, um, also neither. Also, how is this relevant? Um, she asked them if they were going to be changing their name, like asked them all of these really invasive questions about their transition. And like, I think that she thought that she was showing that like, I'm cool with this, like I'm cool with your transition. I'm interested in it, but like, it's really invasive actually, and really not your business. So even if you're supportive, it doesn't give you the permission to ask really personal questions. Um, so even if you're curious, don't ask. Okay. Um, other situations, like when we have taken our baby to the pediatrician, we have been asked, who's the real mom? How do you think that feels? <laughs> who's the real mom? Uh, we're both his real mom. Uh, I think what they meant was who carried the baby. So that's different question and actually really is almost never relevant at a pediatrician visit. Um, but could be maybe, but 
thinking about how you ask those questions, being mindful of like, how would that come off when you're the person who like is in this situation, you know, like just being really mindful of your language, um, being asked like in, like at pediatrician visits, not by my doctor, she's amazing, but like by ancillary staff or whatever, like, well, like how'd y'all get the sperm? Like, okay, that's really irrelevant. Like if you wanna know about the health history of the sperm donor, that's a relevant question, but like, it's really not your business if we went through a sperm bank or if we used a known sperm donor or whatever, like those things that again, like sometimes people are just like, interested and like, well, I'm supportive of like queer people making families. And I just kind of want to know, but like, don't ask, like, it's not your business. You wouldn't ask straight people if they had to do fertility treatments to make their babies. Right. So like, don't ask us, you know? Um, so just kind of like sometimes well-meaning supportive people ask questions by the urge, um, you know, with trans people, like if they are there for like allergies, you don't need to know if they still have a penis or if they've had vaginal plasty, like completely irrelevant. So don't ask about it, you know, like just don't ask. Dr. Locke, I'm going to interrupt for a second only because you said we could. Yeah, um, please do. We have a couple questions about what is a PAT appointment? Oh yeah. PAT is like pre-anesthesia testing and all patients have to have one before they go do to surgery. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so other things like taking a more inclusive sexual history. Uh, so like when I talk to patients, I mean, as a gynecologist, this is a thing I do all the time is talking to patients about sex. Uh, so when I talk to patients about their sexual history, I always say, when we talk about your body today, uh, are there words or phrases you would prefer I avoid? I sometimes have patients who like, they don't want me to say the word breast. They want me to just call it their chest. Cool, I can do that. Or I have patients who don't want me to say the word vagina. Okay, fine. We'll say like your lower parts or your front opening or whatever. Like we find ways to say things that make them more comfortable. And the other phrase that I use a lot is what body parts do your partners have? And that's a really, really, really intentional question. And I use that because number one, like, like when I was in med school, it was like the woke question to ask was, do you have sex with men, women, or both? And um, how would I answer that? My partner is non-binary. So neither, <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know. Like, what is, what does that question even mean? You know, like, I really just need to know, like, what are your risk factors? Like, are you at risk for pregnancy? How do I need to counsel you about STIs? Like, that's what I need to know as a gynecologist. So I really need to know, like, what body parts are you interacting with? Um, and then we'll talk more about like, how are you interacting with those body parts to talk more about your risk factors? So what body parts do your partners have? And I intentionally say partners and I make it plural. And that's really on purpose because if I assume that my patient's monogamous, they're not going to correct me and tell me that they're non-monogamous. That's gonna feel really like bold. And uh, I mean, maybe they will. I you know, depending on my relationship with the patient, but like most patients are not going to feel empowered to say, well, actually I have multiple partners and can you talk to me about how I can do this safely? But if I assume you have multiple partners, right. You know, and then, oh no, you can correct me. Just one. Okay, cool. Moving on. You know, it makes that, that non-judgmental space. Um, and, uh, just makes them feel comfortable and safe. And like, you can tell me what's going on. And that's, that's super, super, super important. Um, so other special topics, so non-binary patients, you know, obviously this is something I feel really strongly about since my partner is non-binary, a lot of non-binary friends. And I, I find that this is a topic that a lot of cisgender heterosexual people, or we, we abbreviate, we, the, we, the gays, we abbreviate that cishets. So the cishets have a lot of problem with this. This like confuses y'all. I don't know. Uh, so non-binary people, they might present as masculine. They might present as feminine. They might present as like somewhere in between every presentation is valid. Like they do not have to present as androgynous, like, um, Sarah Ramirez there, even though they're a very wonderful example of a very attractive non-binary androgynous person. 
Um, some non-binary people will use they, them pronouns. Sometimes people will say, oh, I use she and they, meaning they use both. And in that case, you should use both. You shouldn't say, oh, I can use she and they, so I'll just use she because I'm more comfortable with that. You should use both if they use both. Um, but one of the things that I hear a lot from straight people, and like, you're probably not going to like me saying this, but it's true, is that like straight people love to be like, well, I just don't like this because like the grammar, like it's not grammatically correct. And I just really, oh, it's so hard for me because I just love grammar. It's, this isn't, first of all, like, first of all, like it's not cute. And this is not an original thought. I live with someone who uses they, them pronouns. You want to know how many times they hear this? <laughs> One million. And it's absolutely exhausting. <laughs> okay. Um, your grammar hang up doesn't take precedence over someone's gender identity, right? And uh, also it is grammatically correct. We use singular they all the time, all the time, not just in gender situations. Like it's always been grammatically correct and uh, you gotta just get over it and let it go and uh, do what's right for people. So um, I, I hear this a lot. I'm really tired of hearing it. Please don't say it. Um, I had to like stop surgery the other day because anesthesia was like going on a rant about like, I hate using they, them pronouns. I'm like, I don't like, I don't care. <laughs> I just don't care. That's what the patient uses. That's what we're going to use. Your opinion on it is like pretty irrelevant, you know, like must be nice to be cisgender and heterosexual and just like the world is made for you and your right handedness and all those things. But like, it's not for all of us. And like, I don't know, you can bend on this. So if you mess up pronouns, right? We all do. We all mess up pronouns. It happens. It's okay. What you need to do is you just correct yourself briefly and move on. Okay. You do not make, need to make it a big deal. You should not make the patient feel like they need to reassure you or comfort you or anything like that. You just correct yourself, briefly apologize, move on. Okay. You make it as not a big deal as possible. And that is the most comfortable for the patient. Try to practice in your head. I try to do like three times in my head each time I make a mistake. Um, kind of a like cute thing that we say in the queer community is like, if you mess up somebody's pronouns, like if it's someone in your life, right? Like if you, somebody you love changes their pronouns and you're trying to get it right, like practice in your head with like a compliment, you know, like you'll be like, oh, like thinking about Kim, like, oh, they look very cute today and they've been really nice and they've been really helpful lately. Like give, like use them they pronouns in your head like three times in a really positive way and that will help your brain like get it right if a colleague messes up you just correct it quickly without judgment and move on so like i mean again and this happens like just in day-to-day -day life the number of they's in my life is a lot and so like for example sometimes me and my spouse will be talking about someone and i'll be like oh, you know, Katie's going to come to my house and uh, they're going to cook me dinner. And Kim will say, oh, what's she going to make? And I'll say they, and they say, oh yeah, what are they going to make? And we just move on. You know, like it doesn't have to be a big thing. You don't have to like scold someone. Everybody doesn't have to like feel mad at themselves. You just like say the right pronoun. They say, oh, yep. Thanks. Correct themselves. And you move on. It's pretty easy. It doesn't have to be a big deal. You don't have to beat yourself up about it. Everybody messes up, but you just keep working on it. Um, the big, 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 big thing is that like, we set the standard, right? Um, don't stand for disparaging talk behind the patient's back. Um, it's getting better. When I first started, I had to do a lot of like sticking up for patients and that got really exhausting. Um, like even just like things that like, maybe it seems innocent, but like, imagine if the patient could hear it or imagine like if it was you, um, things like, I don't know, like I've had trans women who had babies with a cis female partner. And then everyone was like, oh, so like, she's really the dad. Like, no, please, God, don't say things like that. You know, that kind of stuff. And like, so as the like cis het person, that's how you be an ally is like, if you make it where like people can't say things like that in front of you, that makes a really huge difference for changing the culture. If you are willing to speak up when you hear trans and homophobic talk, that's what changes the culture. And like, it's, you know, it's hard. And I know it's hard. Um, it makes a huge difference. Um, just the other day, like my spouse was at work and someone was going on a rant about how they didn't think that to, women should be able to be married to each other and that their pastor would no sooner marry two dogs. And they were saying this in front of my 
spouse and all of the straight people around them just like awkwardly chuckled. And like, do you know how powerful it would have been for one of the cishet people in that space to have said like, hey, that's super inappropriate, right? Like, that's your, that's your job. <laughs> like, take care of your other, your people. <laughs> like, y'all call each other out, you know, because like to put that burden on the queer people in that space, it's really hard. Like, it's really hard to be the queer person or to be the trans person like and say like call out transphobia that's extremely difficult but like that's how you can be an ally and that's how you can make a huge difference in changing the culture and making this a safer place to work and to get care as a patient so that is all i got um and would be happy to take questions Dr. Lock, thank you so much. I assume that's a more current picture of your family. Yeah, that's the fam. <laughs> the last time we saw him, he was little. Yeah, he's big now. <laughs> okay, we, we've got definitely got questions coming in. Um, so the first question was, tell me about like, when do you start the conversation? At what age do you start the conversation? Like about, about what? About gender? Um, or um, I'm assuming... I'm assuming the question, the person is asking the question about like a child's own gender identity. Um, yeah. Well, if you want to expand on that a little bit more, please feel free to, but I'm going to make that assumption. Yeah. I mean, I think that like, it's totally individual family comfort level, but like what we've tried to do is just like have um, lots of access to like all types of clothes and toys and stuff. And um, there are like lots of good books about gender identity and um, like, who you are inside for kids and just like having that around from an early age is great kids gender identity usually starts solidifying solidifying around age three and so um like whether you like it or not kids know really early on and so the sooner you give them the vocabulary to start expressing that the better Okay, so um, one is someone would like to know, is there data on the proportion or frequency about um, APTs or BAs being called? Uh, so BAs or APTs, let me explain for those people who are not IU Health people. So um, BAs are behavioral alerts. Um, how many of those are being called on trans inpatients at Methodist or at the academic health center? Do we have any data on that? I don't know any data on that. Um, and I, um, for like for our gender affirmation surgery patients, most of our patients don't stay overnight. Um, so our like vaginoplasty patients and our metoidioplasty patients, like the more complex bottom surgery patients, those patients stay inpatient, but like our hysterectomy and top surgery patients, which is like the biggest volume of our gender affirmation surgery patients, they actually go home same day, which is really awesome. So um, I don't know about like behavior alerts and stuff. I hope not often, <laughs> um, but I don't know. Yeah. I know that I've had to file a lot of incident reports uh, over the years just on like staff misgendering and like some mistreatment, unfortunately. So talk a little bit about uh, what you do with a guest if a patient doesn't want you to talk. How do you handle that if the patient has said, please don't talk, but the guest is still in the room? Like if they don't want me to talk about their- About the fact that they're trans or what kind of issue is going on. Yeah. I mean, at that point, you know, just like anything else, like any sensitive health topic, I like as a gynecologist, there's lots of times when I say like, okay, we got to have your partner step out. Like we just have to, you know, to be able to get the visit done or get the exam done. Yeah. There are just times when you have to have them leave to be able to complete the exam. So do you know if there's any movement within IU Health to do um, name badge identifiers with pronouns? Um, this, this person is talking about how they've had, they know some medical students that have had badge, badge identifiers. And do you know if there's any movement within IU Health? Yeah, IU Health just recently made like pronoun badge buddies available. They had like, um, they had them recently. And I don't know when, like, cause I already had mine from Eskenazi, but I, Yes, we had them. They like got them. And um, so they should be available again or still. Yeah. So maybe ask leadership and, and we can also maybe work on navigating and how to figure that out. I had seen them at yeah. Riley before COVID. Um, yes. So I know that Riley had done some work about that ahead of time too. So yeah. Um, 
what are some of the prerequisites for gender affirmation surgery that are not medical, like social support and things like that? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, all of the standards for gender affirmation surgery are set by WPATH, which is the World Professional Association of Transgender Health. Um, right now, I mean, so I'm kind of a whole lecture in itself, but like I personally really disagree with a lot of the WPATH standards of care. So um, for top surgery, they have to have a letter of support from a mental health professional to have their top surgery, um, which is like... <laughs> As a, so as a surgeon, um, like what other surgery do you have to have a mental health evaluation before you do it, right? Um, and as like an adult patient, shouldn't you be able to have like a risks and benefits discussion with your surgeon and make a decision to have a surgery, right? Like I got a breast augmentation. I went to my doctor. I said, I would like larger breasts. He said, here are the risks and benefits of surgery. I said, okay. And I did it. Right. So like, why can my spouse not have said like, I know this is the best thing for me. I know myself very well. I know this is what I need, right? So instead they had to go to a therapist who is inevitably a cisgender person and prove their transness to a cis person to get a permission slip to have gender affirming surgery. Like it's pretty gross when you think about it like that. For hysterectomy and other like bottom surgeries, you have to have letters from two therapists to get your surgery. And for people who are going to be on gender affirming hormones, you have to be on the hormones for a year. So again, like, you know, when I first started, I thought like, oh, well, that seems good, right? I'm a gynecologist. What do I know about psychiatry? It's good that they have to have this mental health evaluation. Like I can't diagnose gender dysphoria, but well, one thing, um, I don't know if you know much about Indiana, but like, have you ever been to Evansville? Like, do you know how many mental health professionals there are that are competent in trans care in, in Evansville? So like what a huge barrier to care it is. Um, there are people who in those smaller towns were extorting patients where like they were saying, well, you know, I don't feel very comfortable with this, but I'll write your letter if you have like four sessions with me and I charge $800 cash. So that's a huge financial barrier to this care. Um, these are patients who like, you know, my patients who are coming to me for a hysterectomy, they've been on testosterone for like 10 years, a lot of times. They've got their legal name changed, their legal gender marker changed, they got a full ass beard, like, they're dudes. And so like to go and have a mental health evaluation at this point is like, come on, like, this is ridiculous. Um, and so those mental health evaluations are really a really big barrier. The other thing is like, again, it's a, usually a cis therapist and you have to go and like prove your transness. Like, so I, I really was like struggling as a gynecologist, like how, how like, well, I don't want to make a mistake, but I also like, this does feel really um, like gatekeeping. And so I was talking with one of my friends who, uh, there's a really great book about this, by the way, everybody should read the book whipping girl. It's about, um, trans health issues and from written by a trans woman. It's really helpful. So I was like talking to my friend and I was like, who is a trans woman? And I was telling her how I was like, kind of struggling with this, like thought process of like, as a surgeon, I don't want to make a mistake, but like this feels gatekeeping, but like, how do I know someone is trans, like, how do I diagnose gender dysphoria? I'm just a gynecologist. And she said to me, you know, someone is trans because they tell you they're trans. And that was so powerful and like really changed my practice. And like, to me as a queer person that really resonated with me because, um, when I came out as queer, um, I got told by a lot of people in my life that I was wrong. <laughs> I got told by a lot of people in my life that I was confused, that it was a phase, that it wasn't really gay, that, you know, and I was like, what do you mean? Like, I'm the one who says I'm gay. Like, I know I'm gay. I'm gay. Like, what do you, how, why does anybody else get a say in this? And I, I think that's how my trans patients feel, right? Like they're trans. They know they're trans. Why does anybody else get a say in this? And I feel really strongly that we should be able to have a conversation about risks and benefits of surgery and you should be able to get your damn uterus out. So that is my opinion on it. That is not the current standard of care. Our patients have to have mental health evaluations by uh, two different people, which is you know, whatever, that's, that's what it is right now. But, um, that's not, I don't think that's certainly best practices, but that's, that's where we're at right now. Long answer. Sorry. <laughs> oh, thank you. We have had a lot of people responding about the fact that IU Health does now have the pronoun badges and the, the information that I'm getting over and over is to contact the diversity and inclusion office, um, at IU Health 
or um, someone also said they will soon be available on the Brand Center website. So they are definitely out there. Jenna, you're popping on. Do you have a, a comment about that? Oh, you're muted. Not about that. Um, just that someone had, as an educator had asked about more resources available related to this topic. Yeah, are you able to, can you talk about, you, you mentioned the book, is it Whipping Girl? Is that what you, your question? Yeah, your, so for me, resources? like, yeah, um, a thing that I did a lot of, so yeah, the book Whipping Girl is really, really excellent. I love that book. Um, I try to follow a lot of trans folks on like Instagram and Twitter. Um, I, um, you know, that I think has been a really helpful thing is just like hearing from trans voices. Um, and um, I, I think that that is what has made me a good provider of care um, for trans people is like listening to trans people. Like, I think that that's the most important thing. Um, there's a really great documentary on Netflix um, called, what is it called? Hold on, I'm gonna remember it. Um, that is all about um, trans representation in the media. Hold on, I'm gonna think about it. Um, and that is a really, really good one. Um, and uh, Disclosure, that's the name of that documentary. I love that. That was a really important, I think a really important piece of media. Um, yeah, those are some, I think, good places to start. Um, so. I also came across the documentary, which I show our ethics fellows called Born to Be. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, a, it's, a, it's about a transgender center in New York. Awesome. Um, so here's a, a question about what about um, a cis or hetero person using the they them pronouns? There's some, the, something, some, some thoughts. She says, I hate the dominance of gender and gender expectations in our culture and how it's embedded in language. Even objects have gender. Um, a boat is a her. But I definitely identify with my sex at birth. What are your thoughts around, around, um, around that? I mean, I think that people can use the pronouns that make them comfortable. <laughs> Um, so like, if it feels better to you to use they, them pronouns, I think that's okay. What about when a family doesn't, ex um, accept pronouns, especially this so the example that they're giving is an adolescent uses they, them pronouns, but the family does not acknowledge. And you're talking with the family and the adolescent, especially if the adolescent uses sex assigned at birth pronouns around the family, what is the best way to be an ally? You know, in that situation, it is, it's really painful, <laughs> like as the physician, but like the safest thing for the patient is to, you know, use the pronouns that they want, that they use around their family. Um, sometimes, um, it, you know, like when you're alone with the adolescent, just like acknowledging like, hey, is this still what you're using around your family? And is that what feels safest to you when we're talking in front of your family? And just like acknowledging it, that you're not misgendering them, that you're doing what's safe. Um, it's tough. I've had those situations. It's really tough. Like for me, I, I really struggle with the unsupportive family. Um, I have a hard time not feeling mad at them, <laughs> just being honest. Um, but that's, that's the safer thing to do for the, for the patient, um, because it's just going to make the family feel angry. And like, you don't want them to feel like you're against them as their healthcare provider. So I'm gonna go back to the, um, the, the therapist for the transgender, because um, we have a therapist on who asked the question. He says, he's a cis male therapist. And when a patient is sent to get a letter of, um, or to get a letter or jump through some other hoops, how can I be an ally while fulfilling that requirement for them? Yeah, so um, the biggest thing is just like making the process of getting a letter as easy as possible for them. That is what my um, allies that are therapists have done and that's made a huge difference for my patients. Um, I have um, a whole list of therapists that I send patients to who are like, yep, I agree. This letter recommendation is nonsense. Let's make it as easy as possible. Um, and that has been huge and has really expanded access for my patients. What do you um, have? What have you heard about what Cerner is thinking about doing or in the process of doing for the they them? Um, this is Cerner, Cerner's a nightmare with gender. Like, there's no place to see pronoun. It's very clunky. I don't know. Cerner and preferred name and pronouns is a nightmare. We've so, been 
I mean, we've like escalated it to like the highest level Cerner people and have not made much traction. And we're a huge healthcare organization. So I don't know. Um, so this person is an MA and, you know, obviously would like to make sure the doctors know in a visit. So the question is, do we, could we document it in a nursing note or, or what would be the best way to sort of help the doctor know? Um, I mean, what my MA does, like, this is so inefficient, but what my MA does on my schedule is like, she literally writes down, uh, like she prints out my schedule every day and like, just writes out the patient's preferred name and pronouns on the side. That's the only way that we have, um, uh, figured out to do it. It's stupid. <laughs> I mean, it's really, truly, and she like digs through the chart to find their name and pronouns because it's not easily accessible in Cerner. There's another question here about insights or recommendations uh, regarding providing gender affirming care for birthing parents and their partners throughout the continuum of care in the maternity center. So they're wondering about language for birth plans, lactation services, providers and staff members. So she kind of was wondering some of your insights. Yeah, I, I have a whole lecture on that that I give. <laughs> um, but like big things are just, you know, uh, I really try to push my, uh, like, especially like my residents and the nurses to get out of the habit of calling all birthing people mama. I don't know if you've ever hung out on a labor and delivery ward, but everybody gets called mama. It's really annoying. Um, you know, we talk about like using the phrase chest feeding for people, if that's what they prefer, um, using the phrase like gestational parent and non-gestational parent. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, yeah, like I said, kind of a whole other talk about how to do birth for gender diverse folks, but it's possible and has been done really beautifully um, at IU. I've been really happy with the care we've been able to give some of my trans mask folks that have decided to carry pregnancies. Um, and a lot of it is about giving patients choice. Like I give patients, I mean, I do this for everyone really big on bodily autonomy, but talking about like, Hey, would it feel better to have a vaginal delivery or a C-section? What would feel better for your gender? You know, like that kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, lots of, lots of autonomy, lots of support. Um, yeah. Are there websites out there or reference or referrals that you could make to someone? I mean, cause I know that there's some really great things, but is, are there ways that you can make give resources to people? I think there's a, there's a website that's like trans birth project. Um, I think that that's what it's called is the trans birth project, um, of all about like trans guys giving birth, which is really awesome. Yeah. Yeah. There's lots of good resources about that. So, um, here's a question about, can a person be cis het until adolescence or young adulthood and then change their gender identity? Absolutely. And like a lot of that, it's not even that they um, are changing their gender identity, it's that they're becoming aware of it. Um, you know, kind of like, again, like I gave the analogy of like, I was never straight. <laughs> I was never straight, but I like, I didn't know. I had no idea that I wasn't straight until I was older. Um, for a lot of people, they don't have that realization. And sometimes we, I think it can be harmful that it's like, we really perpetuate this idea of like, well, I always knew. Sometimes no, like sometimes people didn't always know. Um, you know, you a lot of people didn't know when they were, you know, you didn't have this like deep down, I always felt different. Like sometimes you just, I don't know, you like really rationalize a lot of things in your mind when you're just trying to like be normal, you know? And so, yeah, that's a really typical narrative is like, yeah, going through life. And then all of a sudden it feels sudden to the people in your life, but it probably was a very long, thoughtful process for the person. So I don't expect you to be a, um, an expert on adolescent health, um, but the question, and this might it'll probably be our last question, but um, this person saying, thanks for the update about how young that kids discover or reveal their gender, which she said at about its age three, because he was always taught in the psychosocial stage for role confusion was adolescence, but are they, they're not the same thing, are they? No, not the same thing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like kind of a whole other lecture. <laughs> Great. All right. We, you are getting so many thank yous and so many kudos and people um, just thanking you for, for your candidness, for your openness, and for really just helping us open our own eyes. And so I am hopeful and confident that we are now going to be better professionals um, to our trans community within IU Health. So thank you for the way that you have helped us. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. Yep. All right, everyone. We will see you next month.